list of the great Egypt. First, return the ruins. Welcome to the major regions of Egypt. The major region, that's at the ruins on my own. Oh, that's fine. I gotta do this. Okay, that's good. Life in ancient Egypt was concentrated along the shores of the Nile and divided into two regions. Lower Egypt was situated on the Nile Delta near the Mediterranean. Yes, and Upper Egypt was at the south reaching into Africa. Now it's the game pass. Due to its proximity to the Mediterranean, temperatures in Lower that? Egypt were less extreme than in Upper Egypt. Oh yeah. <laughs> Standing in front of my boat, I don't even know, but we still out here touring. Fuck it. Until 3100 BCE and the unification of Egypt, each region had its own pharaoh and crown. Lower Egypt's crown was red and marked with symbols of papyrus and bees. Upper Egypt's crown was white with symbols of lotus and sedge grass. Just dance. Both regions had competing major cities, most notably Memphis in Lower Egypt and Thebes in Upper Egypt. There were different religious cults in both regions, each worshipping their own major gods. Many of the temples were designed in such a way as to represent the two regions, and ceremonies often incorporated Upper and Lower Egypt in their rituals. You know what game I'm looking forward to? Let's go. Yes. Easy. Welcome to Bringer of Life, the River Nile. It's my favorite element of water. My favorite element in the world. The ancient Egyptians water. called the dark, fertile mm -hmm. soil of the Nile the Black Lands, and the surrounding desert was referred to as the Red Lands. The dramatic difference of productive land opposed to barren desert had a deep influence on cultural ideology, mythology, and religion. Mm, okay, that's kind of fried the land. I gotta find a rollout for this for YouTube because this is very educational. The Nile determined much of Egyptian civilization. For example, the seasonal cycle of the Nile was so consistent that ancient Egyptians created their calendar around it. The flood season, or Akhet, was when the departing floodwaters left arable soil for crops. It was followed by the growing and harvesting seasons, known as Peret and Shemu. These regular seasons, along with abundant wildlife and rich soil, meant that Egypt's denizens were able to nourish themselves and ensure their country's strength in trade. I'm 
miss my, my, my point? The River Nile, flowing from the south to the north, neatly traversed through both Upper and Lower Egypt. All of Egypt's major cities were built along this narrow ribbon of life. Protected by mountain ranges and deserts which acted as natural barriers to enemies, and sustained by the Nile's plants and wildlife, Egyptian civilization enjoyed economic and cultural prosperity for over 4,000 years. Four years. Mm -hmm. That's good living. Both ancient <coughs> Egyptians and ancient Greeks referred to the Nile as the river in their respective languages. Stretching a distance of over 6,700 kilometers, the Nile is one of the longest rivers in the world. It flows south to north, spanning 11 countries. The River Nile originates in the region of the great sub-equatorial lakes, including one of the largest in the world, Lake Victoria near Tanzania. You're born in as quick as mine, man. Get your speed up. Get your fucking speed up. Yeah, sir. You're born in as quick as mine, nigga. The fastest boat in the Nile, you hear me? Oh, shit. I missed my point. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I missed my point. I missed my point. Missed my point. The river flows through African equatorial forests, swamps, volcanic lands, steppes, and deserts, splitting apart for a while and picking up various sediments from each region and carrying them all the way to Egypt. Its main artery, known as the White Nile, rejoins with the Blue Nile in Khartoum. This is where it weaves through rich deposits of silt and nutrients, carrying them along in its wake. The Nile crosses six cataracts from the south to the north, creating natural obstacles between the various sections of the river. The cataracts are long zones of about 100 kilometers where the bubbling and rapidly swirling waters advance tumultuously amid enormous heaps of rocks and benches of hard stone.
Yeah, I know better. I don't even know why you're trying. Oh, I missed my point. Oh, anyway. Move, stupid. What's up? We're gonna stop me. We're gonna stop the bad bad wolf. Sometimes you gotta be the bad bad wolf. Beautiful at night, though, I'll tell you that. It is after crossing Nubia and the first cataract that the river officially returns to Egypt in Aswan. There are still a thousand kilometers before it reaches Cairo and the Delta, bringing life to those living on its shores before it eventually empties into the Mediterranean Sea.
Ancient Egyptian <coughs> irrigation and water use was centered around the Nile. However, they also had access to streams and rivers, as well as several large lakes. The Delta, situated at the north end of the Nile, also known as Lower Egypt, is a large irrigated area where the river splits into several tributaries. The delta had several major brackish coastal lakes, bodies of water separated from the sea by thin strips of land. A mix of deep to shallow waters, salt swamps and sand plains, these lakes were refuge to a wealth of species, as well as water and land plants. The occasional bandit could also be found sheltering within the denser reeds, waiting for the unwary traveler. Welcome to Deserts of Egypt. Reaching out on either side of the lush Nile are the harsh arid western desert and the mountainous eastern desert. They cover nearly 94% of Egypt. Each of these parent deserts have their own microclimate and contain several smaller deserts with a distinctive fauna and flora. Whale fossils were discovered within the depths of the Sahara. Known as the Valley of the Whales, this location is evidence of the seas which once covered the area. desert in the northeast of the Sahara owes its name to its white limestone soil, contrasting with the yellow sand. The wind has eroded the rocks of the white desert into stone mushrooms, the most famous of which is referred to as the finger of God. The Great Sand Sea is a large unbroken desert that reaches out through western Egypt and eastern Libya. 
It is home to a unique geological formation known as Libyan silica glass. The pale yellowish-green material ranges from pebble-sized fragments to glass rocks the size of rough boulders. Welcome to the Katara Depression. The Katara Depression is located in the northwest part of Egypt. Reaching 18,000 square kilometers, the basin is 133 meters below sea level and covered with salt. It is the second lowest point in Africa after the Afar Depression. The climate is very arid, with average temperatures reaching 36 degrees Celsius. The famous Siwa oasis is located on the protected southwestern region. Today, the Katara Depression is utilized for oil exploration. Welcome to Siwa. Yeah. Geographically, the Siwa Oasis is located in a depression 20 meters below. The area's isolation resulted in a unique society and language. While they worshipped the same deities, Siwan temple architecture differed from traditional Egyptian temples. Kingdom Egyptians referred to the oasis as cauldron due to its unique geographical structure. Oases were crucial for nomadic tribes and caravans. Without them, there was no chance of survival in an otherwise harsh landscape. As such, oases quickly became hubs for trade, as well as areas of political control. Because of the dry climate, there is very little rainfall to sustain the oases. Instead, underground rivers flood the natural basins. Since many oases have a north-south orientation, parallel to the Nile, some geologists suggest they were once tributaries of the mighty river. There is evidence that ancient Egyptians attempted to create some oases. <laughs> Whoa. 
The Libyan oases are the best known, as they are geographically and culturally linked to the Nile. These western oases have a distinct geology from the other regions of Egypt. The most famous and important oases are Karga, Dakla, Farafra, Baharia, and Siwa. The Spring of the Sun is one of many thermal sources in Siwa, with the particularity that Cleopatra would have bathed in this one, giving it its name. The presence of the source beneath was attested already by Herodotus during the 5th century BCE, when the oasis was called Amuneon by the Greeks of Cyrene. Niggas be out here barbecue. Niggas been barbecue with since days of times. Okay, 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 okay. Whoa. Oracles predicted the future, delivered omens that could be more or less obscure, and offered divine guidance. The Siwan Oracle was considered one of the three greatest of the ancient world, alongside the oracles of Delphi and Dodoni. Because of the Greek colonies in Cyrenaica, the temple associated Zeus with the worship of Amun. <laughs> it is no wonder that Alexander the Great made the perilous journey to Siwa in order to consult the oracle emulating the actions of mythical heroes such as Hercules and Perseus. This action earned the approval of the oracle who validated his claim as Pharaoh of Egypt. He was confirmed as the son of Amun, conferring upon him the most legitimate claim to date of all Egypt's foreign invaders. Whoa! The powerful and the rich would send gifts or travel great distances in order to ensure their good fortune by gaining the blessing of the Oracle of Siwa. Every successful blessing only increased the soothsayer's prestige. Runner Eubotus, a famous citizen of Cyrene, consulted the Oracle in order to know if he would win the 93rd Olympic Games race in 408 BCE. He did enhancing the standing of the C1 Oracle in the process. <laughs> the Temple of the Oracle of Amun was built in the 6th century BCE by Pharaoh Amasis. In the game, its entrance is guarded by ram-headed sphinxes, the animal representing Amun. They were inspired by similar statuary located at the British Museum. Another option would have a Greek-influenced representation of Zeus Amun, a human-headed... This representation of Zeus Amun was very popular in Siwa.
Welcome to the Fayum. The Fayum Oasis is an enormous basin in the western desert that formed from the Nile's overflow. As such, it is not considered a true oasis, though it gives its name to the region, which covers Lake Morris. The oasis harbors some of the oldest archaeological artifacts of the region, indicating that the area has been inhabited by hunters and gatherers since the Neolithic period. The Fayum Oasis drains into Lake Morris, which was a large freshwater lake, but at some time became a saltwater lake. In the 12th dynasty, ancient Egyptians redirected the water flow with the dam and dug a supply canal using the lake as their reservoir. Irrigation enabled them to continue growing crops of figs, grapes, and olives year-round. Reed boats, feluccas, triremes, and kerkeros were the most commonly found craft within the landlocked waters of Egypt. They were used for various purposes, ranging from daily fishing, trade, warfare, and travel, to the ferrying of massive stone blocks used to build the great monuments of Egypt. The most impressive pyramids of ancient Egypt date from the Old Kingdom and can be found on the sites of Giza, Saqqara, and Dashur. However, one particularly famous pyramid of the time is located elsewhere. During the Middle Kingdom, some pharaohs chose the Fayum as their final resting place. One such ruler was Amenemhat III. His pyramid left a mark on the imagination of antique chroniclers. They refer to it as the labyrinth, mostly due to the vast mortuary temple complex at the foot of the pyramid. Herodotus mentioned that he had visited 12 courts and over 3,000 of its chambers, but he was also well known for being prone to hyperbole.
Amenemhat's pyramid was built with a brick core and covered with stone slabs designed to be impenetrable. The burial chamber, made out of a single block of sandstone, is unique in its design. Richard Lepsius and Flinders Petrie both explored the pyramid site, measuring 385 meters by 158 meters, and identified it as the location of the labyrinth. Their research conditions were difficult, as most of the site had been submerged by the nearby canal. Furthermore, the stones from the complex and the outer casing of the pyramid had been quarried away long ago. Ubisoft decided to give life back to this lost monument and the many crypts that were said to be devoted to the sacred crocodile god, Sobek. Founded during the 5th dynasty, the site was popular during the 12th dynasty under the name of Shedet. During the Ptolemaic era, the metropolis was named Crocodilopolis by the Greeks in honor of the crocodile god Sobek. During the Greco-Roman era, the Clerucs, soldiers of the Ptolemies, settled there after their military service and expanded the irrigation systems. Irrigation and water distribution tripled the arable land and turned the city into a lush and rich area. 27,000 inhabitants lived in its precinct at its height. The city's location was strategic in controlling the many small waterways connecting to the main canal, and thus the Nile. main cult was that of Sobek of Shedet, a divinity associated with water and fertility, both very important to an area that depended on irrigation. Many local villages had the title Town of Sobek added to their official designations. During festivals, ancient Egyptians recited hymns to Sobek, asking for his divine temple of Sobek's economy to flourish by adopting the local embalming mortuary rites. Their sarcophagi were beautifully painted and adorned with amazingly realistic portraits. Oh. 
خب Dial was worshipped within the precinct of Crocodilopolis's main temple. Known as Sobek to the Egyptians and Sukos to the Greeks, it was reported by Strabo that priests fed it with meat, wine, and honeyed milk. They covered its body with jewels and gold. After its death, it was embalmed and placed within the crocodile's grotto alongside thousands of other mummified crocodiles. Welcome to the city of Memphis. They were situated along the Nile's shores. Cities were often designated for government or for worship. Major cities had several temples dedicated to numerous gods and goddesses. Egyptians referred to the organization of their cities as a sepat, or later on by the Persian term gnome. There were 20 One of the largest was Memphis, located in Lower Egypt. It was a key center for religious temples, including their most important deity, Ta, god of creation. Thebes, located in Upper Egypt, competed with Memphis and featured as both a political and a religious center. Two important temples, Luxor and Karnak, were built there. A minor capital of the Sayite dynasty was the city of Sais, this was the last native Egyptian capital of Egypt. During the Third Dynasty, under Pharaoh Djoser, Memphis became the first religious and administrative capital of Egypt. Even when the political capital of Egypt decentralized itself, pharaohs were crowned in this sacred city in order to legitimize their ascension to the throne, up to and including Alexander the Great. Though little remains today save ruins south of Cairo, we can guess at the structure of the city which stretched up to five kilometers in length. <laughs> Memphis was also referred to as the city with the hundred doors or the white walls. These names were in reference to the wall which surrounded the city. Under the protection of Ta, god of craftsmen, 
the city was a thriving religious and economic hub. Welcome to Artisans. It was under the watchful eye of Ta of Memphis, the god of craft and architecture, that ancient Egyptians developed the unique rendition of the world they lived in. However, it is vital to understand that their view of art and those who created it was likely very dissimilar to the modern concept of the word. Instead of artists, the creative culture had skilled and respected artisans. The most significant categories of specialties for crafters were drawing, painting, sculpture. Ancient Egyptian craftspeople created both art and a wide variety of mundane, everyday tools. Every item created had a specific purpose and was produced by anonymous artisans who worked alone or with a team. Most crafts such as pottery and metalworking were utilized for everyday items. Luxury goods and artwork illustrations served temple rituals and were not meant for public display. Artisans rarely signed their names to the work, though they were clearly aware that they possessed a unique skill and talent for the task. Man, what the fuck y'all want me to back up with this alligator in front of me? Cool. Art. To the everyday life of ancient Egyptians. In ancient Egyptian culture, drawing was used as illustration, such as seen in the Book of the Dead. It was also the first step in the creation of a relief. Two-dimensional representations were concerned with order and form, and were intended to honor gods and promote the transition of the soul to the afterlife. Stylistically, Egyptians were concerned with the depiction of the human form's inner self. As such, artistic representation realized youth and perfectly harmonious visuals. An exception to this were scenes depicting hunting and battle where the environment and enemies moved in lively, even chaotic ways. Animals and foes were depicted piled up, as if describing chaos with Egyptians standing in solemn, disciplined poses, bringing order to the scene. Reliefs could be either in high relief or low relief. Either method required a surface suited to the desired technique. Preparation of the surfaces differed depending on the quality of the rock. A quarried block only needed a simple smoothing. Rough cut rock monuments, such as those found in tombs, required work. Often the surface was coated in plaster before being sculpted.
For reliefs, preliminary sketches were drawn in red, then framed with a red grid to position the elements of the scenes. This method likely is the one who draws the outline. of a sculpture began with a drawing. In ancient Egypt, the profession of crafter was organized and relied on a specific hierarchy. Most artisans depended on an institution to provide them with raw materials. ...for craftsmanship, domestic temple workshops. Some royal workshops at their largest covered an area of about 2.8 square kilometers in size. At the domestic level, for lesser extent, the ability to repair tools was a daily necessity. Crafted everyday items could also be bartered for at the local market. Artisans with skills but lacking in resources worked at large estates, where the elite provided them with space to work and raw materials. The most skilled artisans were employed in royal or temple projects and benefited from a special status. They were provided with good workspaces and considered to be highly skilled. An ancient text known as the Satires of Trades has a number of descriptive summaries that offered teasing glimpses into how artisans were perceived. A coppersmith was said to stink and have fingers that resembled crocodile droppings, while potters were said to be like highlight the most enviable position of all, that of the scribe. Located near the Valley of the Kings, Deir al Medina was a settlement created by Order of the King to honor the most skilled artisans. Its name translates as the Monastery of the City. Allocated a house on the initiative of the King, these craftsfolk were regarded with respect and referred to as the Royal Artisans. Those who Archaeologists believe the site was home to skilled and respected artisans for over 100 years. It is considered relating to Egyptian daily life. While much valuable window into the community life of ancient Egyptian artisans. Mm -hmm. 